Well, good morning again. Welcome to Cornerstone. Um, good to see everybody here with us this morning, and we're starting a new sermon series this morning. So uh, we've been going through the book of First and Second Peter for a long time, and we're kind of switching gears a little bit this morning and uh, talking about how we can be more bold in our faith. Um, let me just kind of start off with a question to get your minds kind of geared, get your minds working a little bit this morning. How many of you think that the message of God's love through Jesus um, it's something that's so important that we need to communicate it at every opportunity in every circumstance. You just say that's something that is so important we need to communicate it. Would you agree with that statement? You can nod your head or you can kind of participate here a little bit. Okay, just making sure you're awake. It's something that's so important. I think we all would say if you're a believer in Christ, you would say this is important enough that we need to share it. And, and if that is the case, then why do we all struggle so much with sharing what God is doing in our life? And, and that's the, the, the tension that we face. We know it's something important, and we feel like God nudges us to say something to someone, and yet we let fear, we let timidity kind of grab hold of us, and we say, well, I'm worried about how they will respond, or what will people think of me or what if I don't know what to say and we come up with all sorts of excuses that prevent us from sharing what God really wants us to share and, and so over time then uh, on top of that what happens is if you've been a believer for a while um, you kind of lose a little bit of that excitement that you once had and so you were all gung-ho you were excited and geared up and and, and, and telling everybody, uh, telling everyone about what Jesus was doing in your life. And, and over time, you just get busy. Your priorities shift and change. And, and then we kind of compartmentalize our lives a little bit. And so our weekdays are just filled with work and surviving. And, and you know, get home and getting supper and ready and getting the kids in bed. And, and just you get busy. And then weekends get here and Saturdays like your catch-up day and you've got to get everything done and the yard work done and and then Sunday you get oh it's it's church day and you get excited you come to church and you kind of get geared up and then you go home and relax a little bit and then you're just right back into the the, the grind and and you 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 step back after a few months of that and you realize wait a minute I really hadn't shared my faith I really hadn't talked to anybody about my faith I'm just busy and that's what happens. It's not necessarily intentional, but what happens over time, we just get distracted and we lose our boldness. We lose our urgency to share what God is doing. And, and when that happens, the most important thing in our life becomes private. And although our faith is personal, it was never meant to be private. And so can we just agree that we need to take Christ seriously enough that we actually live boldly for Him? And so that's what this sermon series is going to be about. It's going to, we're going to take several weeks to, to do this. We're going to start with the why. And, and this morning is all about the why. Why should we live boldly? And over the next few weeks, we'll get into the practical side of things. Is how do we do that? How can we be more effective in how we share our faith? But in order to get to the, the how, we've got to deal with the why? And that's what I want to do this morning. I want to lay the foundation for that. We have the most important message in the world, a message that overcomes hate, a message that overcomes injustice, a message that brings peace and reconciliation. And how many of y'all think this world we need, that this world we live in, it needs all of those things? I mean, if you've watched the news, I mean, it's crazy. I mean, this, this last week, it shows how divided our country is. Racial division, political division, cultural division. And the glorious thing about the gospel is when the gospel is applied to the world we live in, what we see is that it breaks down all those barriers. And we are all one in Jesus. And what this world needs is not a political savior because politics isn't going to fix this. And what this world needs is they need the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. As hearts are transformed by the gospel, what we see is that people will stop looking at what separates us and start looking, and, and they'll start looking to what unites us. And so my prayer for our country, my prayer for all these situations that we see and the police shootings and, and, and the division and the, the anger and the tension, this world needs Jesus. 
And, and that's up, and it comes back to it's our responsibility to share that hope. We can't say that it's someone else's responsibility. I saw, uh, you, you know, we, we know this, and we know it, it's important, but yeah, we still remain silent. I, I saw somebody post a video over the weekend uh, of a, a famous magician, um, Penn Gillette, and um, he's an atheist, doesn't believe in God, um, a- actually pretty hostile to the, to the gospel even. But a few years ago, he posted a, a little video blog about an encounter he had with someone after one of his shows. And um, even though he's an atheist, I think he's got some truth we can learn from here. I, I want to show this little video clip. And then he said, I brought this for you. And he handed me a uh, Gideon pocket edition um i thought i said from the new testament but i also thought it was psalms from the new testament right uh psalms from the new just part of the new testament little book about this big this thick you know he said i wrote in the front of it and i wanted you to have this i'm kind of uh proselytizing and then he said, I'm a businessman. I'm, I'm sane. I'm not crazy. And he looked me right in the eye and did all of this. And uh, it was really wonderful. I believe he knew that I was an atheist. But he was not uh, defensive. And he looked me right in the eyes. And he was truly complimentary. It wasn't in any way, it didn't seem like empty flattery. He was really kind and nice and sane and looked me in the eyes and talked to me. And then gave me this Bible. And I've always said, you know, that I I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and hell, and people could be going to hell, or not getting eternal life, or whatever, and you think that, uh, well, it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. And atheists who think that people shouldn't proselytize, just leave me alone, keep your religion to yourself. Uh, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that. I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, and that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. And I've always thought that, and I've written about that, and I've thought of it conceptually. But this guy was a really good guy. He was polite and honest and sane and he cared enough about me to proselytize and give me a, a Bible, which had written in it a little note to me, uh, not very personal, but just, you know, like to show and so on. And then like five phone numbers for him and an email address if I wanted to get in touch. Now, I know there's no God, and one polite person living his life right doesn't change that. Uh, but I'll tell you, He was a very, very, very good man. And uh, that's really important. And with that kind of goodness, uh, it's okay to have that deep of a disagreement. I still think that religion does a lot of bad stuff, but man, that was a good man who gave me that book. That's all I wanted to say. It's an interesting clip, right? Here's an atheist that does not believe in God that looks and says, okay, if someone, if you really believe there's a heaven and a hell, if you really believe in everlasting life, then how much do you have to hate someone not to tell them, not to share with them that? You know, and what's interesting, the guy that shared with him, he wasn't confrontational, he wasn't angry. In love, he went to him and shared life's most important message. There's a lot we can learn from that. Um, and, and there's a lot that I think that, that we're fearful of, and we're afraid of, and, and yet here we see an atheist who doesn't believe in God say, you know what, he understands this fact better than many Christians. What's riding on this? What's important? 
Um, one study um, that Tom Rainier did said 82% of the unchurched are somewhat likely to attend a church if someone would invite them. But then he went on to say that 98% of people in church have not invited someone to church in the past year. 98%. I mean, the church is silent when it comes to reaching out to those who are lost and hurting. We're good at condemning them, but we're really, when it, when it matters, when we need to share, when we need to invite, when we need to open up and tell them, this is who God is. This is the hope that we have. The church remains silent. And let me just kind of make it personal. Think back on the last month. Think back on the last six months. Have you shared your testimony with someone that is not a believer? Have you shared the story of what God is doing in your life? Now, some of you may have done that, and that's great. And, and, and the, the, the temptation is to pat ourselves on the back and say, yeah, I did it, now it's someone else's turn. No, and this is a responsibility that we all have on a continual basis to look about and think about how we can share boldly. What does the Bible say? This is what Paul says in Ephesians. Uh, in Ephesians, Paul says, pray for me, ask God to give me the right word so that I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan that the good news is for Jews and Gentiles alike. And he's saying, I'm in chains now. He's in prison, still preaching this message as God's ambassador. So pray that I will keep on speaking boldly for him as I should. In other words, it doesn't matter what circumstance you find yourself in life, that we are still required to boldly share about Jesus. In Acts 4, we read the story of Peter and John, and, and, and they're saying here, Now, O Lord, hear their threats against us, and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And after this prayer, the meeting place shook. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and then they preached the word of God with boldness. And so what we see throughout the New Testament is the story of the early church, is the story of boldness. That they, they preached and taught boldly in the face of opposition. Uh, they were not afraid of what others would say or think. So how do we find this type of boldness? Well, one, it starts right here. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. It starts with our relationship with God. And we need to understand why we should be bold. Now, as you look at the Bible, start to finish, the first five books of the Bible were penned by Moses, and they contain no less than 613 different laws or statutes or commands for the Jewish people. And so what happened over time is they became so focused on following all these laws that they forgot about the God who created the law. And so when Jesus came um, and started teaching um, this, the message of the gospel, this is how you can have a relationship with God. This is how your sins can be forgiven. Uh, the religious leaders didn't like it because it didn't, uh, they looked like and, and they would say, well, you're not just following the, to the detail all these little laws that were created. And so they tried to trap Jesus, and in Matthew 22, we see this account. And in Matthew 22, um, the, the Pharisees are saying, okay, which command out of all those 600 and some odd commands um, from the, the book of the law, uh, which of these is most important? And, and so this is how Jesus replied. He said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And so how many of us, we've read this verse, but we've not really processed it and thought about it. What does it really look like to love the Lord our God with all of our heart? What does it really look like? How much of your heart? Are you convicted by statements like that? Look, all of your heart. Now, now, there's some stuff in my heart that sometimes is not good. But, but this command says, I'm, I'm to love God with all of my heart. What about your, your soul? A, a full, wholehearted devotion and passion uh, to, for, to follow Jesus. What about your mind? Is every thought that goes through your mind, does it honor God? 
Do you really love God with all of your mind? What we see here is Jesus trying to simplify all these laws and says, this is where really love, this is where boldness flows from. Do you love God with all of your heart, soul, and mind? And not only that, once you receive that type of love, once you understand that type of love, now you go and share that type of love with others. And so we learn really quick here uh, that boldness that starts with understanding God's bold love for you that leads you to share that love with others. Um, love God, love others. That's at the basis of being bold. And what I want to do this morning, I want to take you to a very familiar passage of Scripture, John chapter 3, uh, a passage that we've heard before. And, and I want us to spend some time there to look at this bold type of love that we have been um, given and, and been commanded to share with others. This is a bold love, and, and this type of love is really, it changes us. So let's, if you got your Bibles, flip over John chapter 3. Uh, this is where uh, the message is really kind of based on this passage here. And it starts, uh, I'll start over in verse 14. It says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. And so right here in this passage, um, what we see is Jesus pointing people to the cross. The Son of Man, he's saying, I'm going to be lifted up. And he's talking about the cross. He's foreshadowing the cross that's about to happen so that everyone who believes may have eternal life. And then we get to verse 16. Probably the most famous, the most recognized verse in, all, in the entire Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's how much God loves us. That's the bold love that he has for us. And he goes on to say, and we typically stop there and we don't read 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And so the first thing I want us to, 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 to understand this morning, the first point I want to make, and then we'll keep going in this passage, but the first point is simply this, love sacrifices when we look at God's love for us, it's a bold love, but it's a love that made a sacrifice. Uh, we all know John 3.16, but we, d we, d we don't really read it in the full context. L let's back up even a little more. Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, he was not a believer. He was one of these guys that was focused on all these 600 and, and some odd laws, and, and we have to do it the right way, and we have to do the right thing. We have to have all this memorized, and we have to check this box off and check this box off. And, and he was one of those guys that was so focused on the law that he, uh, he, 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 did, he, he struggled with who Jesus was. And so when Jesus came, at least he had the honesty to say, I don't understand everything. And so he snuck in the middle of the night to meet with Jesus. Uh, he snuck in the middle of the night so people wouldn't see him. So uh, he, people wouldn't say, uh, you know, well, what's he doing hanging out with Jesus? And, and Jesus, notice when Jesus met with him, he didn't condemn him. He didn't get mad at him. He very gently and lovingly explained the gospel. He told him, you must be born again. And Nicodemus, oh, how can I be born again? I've already come out of my mother's womb. And Jesus explained that that's a spiritual birth. And, and then we get to, to this part where he, he explains to him the meaning of salvation. And for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We see the sacrifice that God made for us. And that sacrifice is what enables us to, to see how much God truly did really love us. I love what Augustine said, one of the early church fathers. He said, God loves each of us as there were only one of us. He, he loves each of us as if there were only one of us. Uh, Billy Graham said it this way. He said, God proved his love on the cross. And when Christ hung and bled and died, it was God saying to the world, I love you you. Is God saying the word, I love you. And so when we look to the cross and when Jesus points us you know, to the cross, what we see is a demonstration of God's love for us. 
And it's easy to think in our mind, okay, well, God, yeah, he died for the, the sins of the world. He died for everyone, which is right. But do we ever stop and think that God died for your sin? For the things that you did wrong. God's how much God loved. He loved you that much. Just read John 3, 16. For God so loved me <laughs> that he gave his one and his only son. And when we start thinking of it in that light, it changes how we view his love. We see how much of a sacrifice that truly is. Uh, Paul says it this way in Romans. He says, but God showed his great love for us. Um, in by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. While we were still messed up, broken people, Jesus died for us. And so when we understand that sacrifice Jesus made, it gives us a boldness to share the love that he demonstrated for us. Um, even in, in Philippians, it, it talks about how Jesus can empathize with us because he's, he's endured the same struggles and temptations and the difficulties, the grief that we have gone through. In Philippians 2, it says, Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He emptied himself. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. That's the sacrifice that Jesus made for you. And when you see the good news, the gospel, that Jesus Christ died for our sins so that we could be made right with God, we cannot help but tell others. And that's kind of the next point on your outline here. It's just that, that our boldness, it is born out, uh, uh, it's behavior that's born out of belief. It's behavior that is born out of belief. And so what we see here is what we believe determines how we behave. And so when we really get our belief right, it helps our uh, behavior get right. But it starts with understanding what Jesus did for us, the sacrifice that he made. And so understand this. And, and we know this, right? Our boldness is a behavior born out of belief. If we are a worried person and we're constantly worried about what people say, what are they going to think? Man, I'm going to look stupid if I go up and say something and do something. And, and, and that's kind of the mindset we have. Then what's the behavior born out of that? It's timidity. It's to say, well, it's somebody else will do it and somebody else will, will say something and, and we kind of shrink back and, and we kind of like hide a little bit and we think, well, it's not really my responsibility. But when we get the flip of that, flip side of that is if your life has been changed and you understand the sacrifice that Jesus made for you, then you get excited about that and you say, wait, I've got to tell everybody about what Jesus has done in my life. There's been a change. I'm not the same person anymore. That person I used to be, that's not who I am now. And let me tell you what has changed in my life. Boldness is behavior born, uh, born out of belief. And, and it starts with understanding that. The Greek term that's translated bold or boldly or bold, boldness throughout the New Testament, it, it means honesty in the face of opposition. And so what we see with the, the, the definition itself is boldness. It's not determined by how the other person responds. It's not determined by what the other person thinks about what you say. It's not determined by our success in what we share. Boldness is really about being obedient. It's about listening to God and doing what he says. And so our time with Jesus, it builds our faith. It, it, it helps, uh, you know, as our foundation of belief is, is solidified and we start understanding who Jesus is and learn more about his character and his nature and his ways, it helps us to be more bold in what we share. Second Timothy, Paul says it this way. He says, God has not given us a, a spirit of fear and timidity. That's, that's, that's how most Christians live, though. They live in this spirit of fear. I don't want to offend anybody. If I, you know, I'm afraid if I'm honest, I'm going to offend somebody, and then they're not going to like me anymore. And so we're timid. But, but here we read, but God's given us this spirit of power, of love, of self-discipline. 
a power and love and self-discipline. Um, Jennifer told me, said, this is one of the, the theme verses for praising in the park that we're going to be focusing on with the kids next week. That God has given you this type of a, 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 a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. One of the biggest traps that Satan tells us, he convinces us that we don't really have to be bold in sharing our faith. We just live a good life and that's good enough. Just go to church. Just do the right thing. And people will look at your life and say, oh, that must be a Christian. And, and then maybe they'll come and ask you about it. Now, well, that's a good thing. Is that really what being bold really is? Uh, there, there's a quote even. It's a famous quote, and I'm sure you've probably heard it. It's one of those tweetable quotes, and uh, you see it all over the place. And it's attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. And, and, and it says, preach the gospel always, and if necessary, use words. Have you all seen that before? There's a problem with that quote. A couple of problems, honestly. The first is that nowhere can we find any evidence that he actually said that. You look through his biographies, you look through his writings, his sermons that are recorded. Um, there's really no evidence that he said that. And in fact, his life really contradicted that. His life, if you look at his biographies, it said this. It said, he denounced evil whenever he found it. He made no effort to palliate it from him. A life of sin was met with outspoken rebuke. He spoke with equal candor, with equal truth to great and small. Another guy said his, his words weren't hollow, they weren't ridiculous, they were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. They penetrated the marrow of the heart so that listeners were turned to great amazement. Here was a guy that whenever he saw evil, he confronted it. He was bold. He preached in word. And really, and so the, the, the problem with that statement, preach the gospel always and if necessary use words, it's kinda, it kind of ties into this postmodern belief that we really can't tell anyone else how to live their life. That, that we really can't share truth with them because, well, it may hurt their feelings a little bit, so let's just live a good life and, and we don't really have to use words. But that's not what the gospel commands us to do. How will they hear the gospel if, if we don't speak it? How will they see and meet Jesus if we don't tell them? It's what Romans 10.4 says, right? How are they to call on him and on who uh, they have? How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how, they can, how, how can they believe in the one in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And so we read this and we think, well, that means a preacher's got to preach. No, this is a command to all of us. Right before this, right, Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10, 13, for all who call on the name of Jesus shall be saved. And then we get to this, and it's our responsibility to tell them. And so let me, if I can just impress upon you this morning, is that it's not someone else's responsibility to share the gospel. It is everyone's responsibility to share the gospel. We need to be bold. A better saying would be, preach the gospel, use actions when necessary, and always use words. That's, that's a better statement. Because that's really what we're called to do. Not to be timid, not to be fearful, not to worry about what everyone else thinks, but to, to, to understand that, that we are called to be bold. It's behavior born out of belief. And so the first thing, again, love sacrifices. Love, we see God's sacrificial love for us, and it causes us to step out in faith and sacrifice some of our own comfort to share with others. The second thing in, 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 in John 3 here um, is that love believes. Love believes. A bold love is a love that believes. Uh, verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. When you spend time with Jesus, you come out of it with boldness. And boldness isn't being obnoxious. It's not like I'm going to shove it down your throat whether you want to hear it or not. Boldness can be gentle. Boldness can be kind. Boldness can come from a loving heart. It's not mean. It's not pushy. Um, boldness, it, it doesn't reflect what, a worry or anxiousness about the, how the other person responds. It just simply, 
I'm going to share my faith because I believe. Because I've not been condemned. I've now been set free. I've been forgiven. I've been made right with God, justified with God. So now I want to share that same love with others. Romans 1, 16 says this, For I'm not ashamed of the good news, of the gospel about Christ. It's the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. The Jew first and also the Gentile. And so throughout the New Testament, we see this word belief, belief, belief. It's what our faith is based on. Do you believe? And so boldness is this spirit-given conviction that we've got to speak about what we've seen and heard. In Acts chapter 4, earlier I read a, a, just a verse in 29 and 30 about Peter and John. And, and what, what's interesting when you look at Acts chapter 4, it's a good chapter. I, I encourage you to go and read it this week. Acts chapter 4, kind of make a note of it. Go back and read it. And what you see is, is that Peter and John, they were proclaiming uh, the resurrection of Jesus. They were telling people, this is how you are saved. The religious leaders didn't like it. There was opposition. They threw them in jail. Uh, and, 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 you know, and at that point, uh, for our culture today, when we face that type of opposition, it's usually when we kind of, uh, well, we, we kind of give up. When we say something and if we were arrested, it's kind of when we get to the point and say, well, we kind of got to round off the edges. We got to make this a little more acceptable for people to hear because it kind of gets us in trouble when we share it this boldly. For them, it just made them more bold. And, and instead of toning it down, they just amped it up and and so what we see happen in, in Acts and in, in Acts four four it says many of those who heard the word believed and the number of men came to be about five thousand people and, and so uh, you see they they started growing and they were imprisoned and, and and then we see we see just keep growing and growing and and in Acts four ten it says um, let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that, that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And it says there's salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. It's, 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 it's really interesting here. Instead of backing up, instead of saying, oh, you know, let, let's tone it down, they're saying, no, the Jesus is the answer. And they just keep pointing back to Jesus. And, and what's interesting, they were in prison for this. They were, they were thrown in jail. And, and again, we get discouraged whenever we face a little bit of opposition. When we had our youth at the, um, uh, the student life camp a few weeks ago and and we did some service projects and just some outreach type ideas when we had some free time. And so we went out and we bought a couple hundred bottles of water and we're at Myrtle Beach and, and we just loaded up the coolers, went out to the beach and said, okay. Um, we kind of just cut them loose and said, go hand out free water to people. Ask them how you can pray for them. And, and we just were handing out free water. It was really interesting seeing the response you got. Some people were just really appreciative, say, oh, yeah, here's how you can pray for me. And they were able to have prayer, and it was really interesting to see that. Some people were kind of not so appreciative. You know, you had one guy that's like, oh, I've got my beer. I don't need your water. You know, I mean, you had that kind of response. And then you had the response of, oh, you got free water, great. Oh, but you're with the church. I don't want it. And so I'm, I'm telling you, a few of the youth came back a little discouraged. They're like, man, people are mean. And one, one, one of them, I'm not going to call her out, she came back and was like, I'm never doing this again. <laughs> and, and we're like, and you know what? She went back the next day and did it again. So, but she was discouraged. And, and here's why. She's like, you know, you know, why are people like, why are people rejecting? And we're like, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting the gospel. Our responsibility is to be faithful in presenting it. It doesn't really matter how they respond. Now, we want them to respond in a favorable way, but we can't control that. We have to just trust God, just like the guy that handed the atheist in the, in the video, the Bible. Our, we can't control how he's going to respond, but, but you know what? He made an impact on that guy, and there may be at some point in his life where he's broken to the point where he turns and realizes that there is a God and he needs him. And we've planted that seed, we've planted that opportunity for God to move and work in that person's life. 
And so we need to understand that our responsibility is to just keep talking about Jesus. In Acts 4, Peter and John, they just keep talking. They just keep talking. And in Acts 4, 13, you see this boldness is something that just comes from deep inside. And when, they, when the religious leaders, when the council, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Man, I want that to be my life. That when people are around me, they just take note. Man, you've been with Jesus. They, they see Jesus and, and they just see their boldness. Uh, they see the boldness. They just see that they were not afraid of what was going to happen to them. And not, not afraid of what people thought. They're just going to be bold. I'm just going to keep talking. I'm just going to keep talking. Why? Because I've been with Jesus. And, and that's really the, the point, the next point in your outline there. Spiritual boldness. It comes from knowing Christ. And that's, that's really the source of our boldness. It comes from knowing who Jesus is. It comes from a real relationship with God. I'm afraid that there's a whole lot of people in our churches today who claim to be Christians but don't really have a relationship with Christ. And if your religion is based on attending church and being a good person, you don't have much motivation to be bold because it simply costs too much. You don't want to be rejected. But when your identity is in who you are as a believer, I've been saved, I've been born again, I've been given a new life, I once was dead, now I'm alive. When our identity is wrapped up in what Jesus has done in our life, how he has saved us and transformed us, then it leaves us with no other option but to be bold. And when you really know Christ, you want to tell everyone. Acts 4.19 um, and keep going in that. Peter and John replied, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? And verse 20 says, we cannot stop telling everything we have seen and heard. Man, this is so important that we understand this, this type of bold love that just flows out of us. We've been with Jesus. We can't, we can't just stop. We, we got to keep talking. We got to tell everyone. It just flows out of us, this goodness that we have seen. And, and so uh, that, that's the second thing. Love sacrifices. Love believes. The third thing, let's, let's keep going, is that love reveals. In verse 19 in John chapter 3. It says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the, into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that, though, that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. And so here we get a description of why people reject the gospel. They're rejected because they're afraid that their evil deeds will be brought out into the light and be exposed. And, and so they, they, they keep hiding it. They keep fleeing and running from God because they love the things of this world more than they love God. So again, when people reject the message, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting God. And, and our, what we're called to do is continue to bring things from the dark into the light. And sometimes that's uncomfortable, and sometimes we don't like to do that. But, but there's this false idea that love means acceptance, that we really can't speak out against evil or sin or injustice in this world because, well, we can't really tell them that's wrong. No, love compels us to reveal the truth, to bring things from the dark into the life. It compels us to confront sin, to go into the dark, evil places of, of society. To reach out to the lost, the sinful, the hurting. To reach out to those who are despised and rejected. To reach out to those who have been condemned by society. Often the most loving thing we can do is to help someone move from the darkness into the light. And so what our love does, it doesn't compromise what it believes. It doesn't compromise. In fact, we, spoke bo we speak boldly about what we believe deeply. We speak boldly about what we believe deeply. And if you believe something deeply, it's easy to be passionate about it, to not compromise, to share what you believe. I, I kind of close with a story uh, that, that many of you probably have not heard. Some of you may have. But back several years ago, um, there was a boycott against Chick-fil-A. Do you all remember that being on the news? 
It was uh, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender movement against Chick-fil-A because Chick-fil-A was supporting foundations and, and groups that were uh, against homosexuality and promoted marriage between one man and one woman. So there's this massive boycott uh, against Chick-fil-A that turned out to backfire because more people actually went to Chick-fil-A. Um, but the news was all over it, and they covered it and kept talking about it and tried to make a big deal about it. Um, and what was interesting, what came out of that is something that really wasn't covered very much, it is that very early into this boycott, the founder, the president, or the, the, the president, COO, the, the founder's son, Dan Cathy, reached out to the guy who was leading the boycott against them. Very private way, he reached out to him and said, hey, I want to talk to you. I want to get to know you. I want to understand what, what upsets you. And so it initiated a series of meetings um, between uh, th this homosexual guy and the founder of Chick-fil-A. Um, and and what's, um, what was interesting, um, this is what he wrote. He said, after months of personal phone calls, text messages, and in-person meetings, I'm coming out in a new way, and I'm coming out as a friend of Chick-fil-A's president and COO, Dan Cathy. And he said, I'm nervous about it because he was afraid now that he was coming out and saying, man, this Dan Cathy is a good guy, that all of his friends would start attacking him. And he went on to talk about it. And he, he said, through all this, Dan and I shared respectful, enduring communication and built trust. His demeanor has always been one of kindness and openness. Even when I continue to directly question his public actions and the, his funding decisions, he embraced the opportunity to have, to have dialogue and hear my perspective. He and I were committed to a better understanding of one another. And get this, it says, throughout the conversations, Dan expressed a sincere interest in my life, wanting to get to know me on a personal level. He wanted to know about where I grew up, my faith, my family. And in return, I learned about his wife and kids and gained an appreciation for his devout belief in Jesus Christ and his commitment to being a follower of Christ more than a Christian. Dan expressed regret and genuine sadness when he heard of people being treated unkindly in the name of Chick-fil-A, but he offered no apologies for his genuine beliefs about marriage. And in the end, I mean, Dan invited him to join him in the, the president's suite for the Chick-fil-A Bowl. I mean, here you have the most unlikely of people becoming friends. Why? Because Dan Cathy was bold enough to say, let's sit down, let, let me really tell you about my Jesus. Now, th this guy didn't turn his life around. and you, you don't have the happy ending that you expect from a, from a Hallmark movie. But what you do see is you see how we can boldly be a light to the world around us. How we can share Christ, even with people who disagree with us, without worrying how we can lovingly and not condescendingly. We don't have to be hateful, we don't have to be mad, but we don't have to be afraid of sharing the truth. And can I just challenge all of us, that's really what bold love, it's not to compromise, but to reach out to someone even when they are attacking you. It's to reach out even um, when there is conflict or the possibility of conflict. And so can I just ask you this morning, do you have that type of love? Do you have that type of a bold love? Don't let cowardice win out over courage. I want to challenge you. Take out your, the praise team's going to come back up. I want you to take out your, your worship guide right now while they're coming up. Here's my challenge to you. Would, would you just be open right now to, to writing out some names of people that you feel like you need to, that God is leading you to share Christ with? And I want, right now, we're going to get in over the next few weeks on the how, a little bit how we can do that. But right now, I want you to start praying for God-given opportunities to do that. I want you to pray that God would open up these doors of opportunity um, that, 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 that just to put you in the right place at the right time. Um, I, I shared first service a, a story from a recent mission trip to Nicaragua. Um, one, one of the uh, teenage girls was there, and she was just kind of in the right place at the right time. She didn't really know it. She was walking by to take a picture, and there's a whole bunch of kids, and they were getting a little rowdy and restless. And I'm like, okay, Houston, share the gospel with these kids. And she was walking by like, what? And at that moment, she was given a God-given opportunity. Yeah, I put her on the spot a little bit. But she was given an opportunity. And she could either say, I'm not doing that. But she just looked at me. She said, okay, I'm going to do it. She was in the right place at the right time. She shared the gospel. 
gave the sinner's prayer. People responded. People were saved. It was incredible to see God working through her and talking through her. Can you, do you realize that God can do that in your life as well? When you just open up and say, here I am, God. Use me. Speak through me. Help me to be bold. Help me not to be afraid uh, to take the opportunities you have given me to share about your love, your bold love for the world. Because Jesus came into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved. Would you guys pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we pray this morning for a boldness as we leave this place that you would give us a courage to not be ashamed of the gospel. That we would boldly proclaim the truth that we will boldly proclaim the gospel message, the good news that Jesus died for our sins. That he came and lived a perfect life and died the death to take our punishment and our shame. And that when we put our faith and our trust in Jesus, that he forgives us of our sin and gives us a new life. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for your love, a love that was sacrificial a love that that shows us how to believe and a love that reveals the truth to us. And so this morning, Lord, just help us to leave this place encouraged and motivated by that love. If there's anyone here this morning, Lord, that, that doesn't know you, may this right now be an opportunity to turn their life around, to put their faith and their belief and their trust in you. And so as we have a time of response, Lord, help us to be bold in how we respond. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we have a time of response here at Cornerstone and and there's multiple ways you can respond. You can come up to the cross and and write out your prayers and just leave them there. Maybe some of you just want, are so thankful for what Jesus has done. You want to come up and receive communion and we have two stations where you can come up and, and receive communion this morning. And some of you for you just need to come to the front and bow down and kneel down and just say God give me more boldness. Help me not to be ashamed. And maybe some of you, there's a decision, a commitment that you need to make. God is calling you to follow Him. Or, or you need prayer about a certain circumstance or issue in your life. I'll be in the back and I would, I would love to, to be able to pray and talk with you this morning. Let's stand up as we close this morning.